All right, everybody should be here now. Boosh. I'm looking a little bit rough, so. Yep, they're all you coming look beautiful. in. Oh, well, thank you, Megan. Okay, ya todos están entrando. A ver, perdóname. Por esta. Uy. Encroaching on the camera. All right, my friends. I've got my glasses on. I'm ready to go. How's everybody doing today? Good. Awesome. Okay, my good friends, today we are on our, what, six of seven um, day of webinars. Today's day really is uh, focused on promotion um, and graduations for your language, multilingual, especially your SLIFE kiddos. These are some of our very underrepresented and most vulnerable kiddos in our school system. So we wanted to make sure that we had some time dedicated just to them because we've been getting a lot of questions about, hey, Megan, hey, Alexandra, what do you think about this? How do we approach them? How is it different than what we're doing for our other sort of multilingual learners, okay? So I wanna make sure that we take some time to first and foremost, make sure that you contact and from me. You guys know today you are getting two for the price of one because not only do you have Alexandra, but you have our most fabulous Megan. <laughs> Any of you who have ever met at Megan know that you will fall in love with her in literally two seconds at the drop of a dime. Uh, um, so I'm gonna stop because you guys know that I get tired of my own voice. Megan, do you want to introduce yourself really quickly to those folks that may not necessarily know who you are? Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Alexandra. Hello, everybody. I'm thrilled to be here with you. So thank you, Alexandra, for having me join you on this Wednesday's webinar. Secondary is um, near and dear to my heart when it comes to bilingual education and dual language programming. I began um, my teaching career in the secondary classroom as a Spanish instructor and then became Spanish language arts in an immersion uh, program, later doing program leadership, and then uh, instructional coaching. And now I'm consulting with Taju and, and working with Alexandra. So this is an important conversation to be having uh, right now for, for this group of, of learners, particularly in the secondary level. So I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Yay! Again, um, Megan, she lives and breathes secondary, even though she's been sort of um, inducted by fire into the elementary world. Yeah. <laughs> but secondary is well. its own, yeah, right? Like yeah. a secondary is its own unique world. So yeah. we wanted to make sure that we brought her into the loop, okay? Um, I want to make sure that before we jump too far into um, today's content, that everybody knows how we define this space, like who it is that we're talking about uh, um, right now. And so co-facilitator, co, co if we'll go forward one. We're gonna get there. Ah, my bad. We wanna make sure that before we get into the content that everybody remembers um, the equity framework. So this again, is something that sits very near and dear to her, our heart. Um, it's what sits at the core, sits and serves as sort of the nucleus of everything that we do. So regardless of what the PD is, I want to make sure that everybody always understands that this is the sort of theoretical, philosophical, personal sort of sort of foundation um, that sits at the at the heart and the and the and the sort of the footing of everything that we do. Um, this is very, very much part of what we utilize and, and thinking about what recommendations should we, should we share? Should we um, sort of elevate the 
uh, to the narrative of what's happening happening for secondary learners. Um, and so we want to be very transparent in that, that this is the underlying foundation, theoretical foundation that serves um, as the basis for everything. Look at that, Sam. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So I think this is still me, right, Megan? You got it. Awesome. So I want to make sure that everybody is on the same page. When we talk about MLs, like multilingual learners, it's students that are navigating a variety of languages, whether they are coded L's, dual language, right? But for SLIFE, depending on what state you're in, are a subgroup within that category. So I can be coded in the system as a student, as I once was, as an English language learner, right? I can be coded as an L. There are Title III requirements that the state and or districts, district has to ensure that they provide to me, right? But within that group, there's a subcategory of students that have limited or interrupted formal education. Those students, depending on what state you're in, are either coded SIFE or SLIFE. Particularly right now, these students are in an extreme sort of, um, they're in jeopardy because of the fact that SIFE and SLIFE students have a timeline. It's sort of a ticking clock of they have 12 months to be coded for most schools, 12 to 18 months max. There's a couple of districts that I found that have extended the calendar to 18 months of being coded as SIFE or SLIFE, which means that if I'm a 15 year old and I've never been in school before, a formal education that pairs or has some level of parity to the United States, or if I'm an eight year old and literally if this is my first school experience I have 12 to 18 months in the US to figure out what that might look like and to develop all the schools, conceptual knowledge, background knowledge, all of the prerequisites to be successful as a student in a US school. Which carries own set of, own set of stakes, okay? Now, even if I am not a SIFE or SLIFE student, for multilingual learners in general, there are state requirements that carry their own high stakes. And I wanna make sure that everybody understands what they, they are so that everybody has um, the grounding and the footing to understand what they need to do and what they need to advocate for moving forward. Number one, is that students in the secondary level, most times sixth through eighth, if not earlier, have multiple teachers rather than one core teacher in an elementary building. In elementary schools, you have your homeroom teacher, you have your teacher, and then you might have some ancillary specials, depending on what your state calls them, right, which may be art, PE, computers, library, something of that nature, okay? That in and of itself poses some problems because each teacher has their own requirement in terms of how they produce a justifiable grade and what requirements they have in terms of meeting graduation requirements, program um, and, and um, promotion requirements, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Some people might not realize this, but if I'm a high school student, I gym credit, I actually don't get to graduate. Those are things that we have to have a conversation about um, in the secondary level that does not necessarily have to happen in the elementary level. Mm -hmm. In addition, I want to make sure that everybody understands that our secondary students are our our support systems, I don't want to say 
that they are adults or they are caregivers or anything like that, but they are critical support systems to the functioning of a family during this pandemic. If you have a student that you're serving and they're 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, right? The students do not age out until the age of eight, uh, 21. They most likely have significant responsibilities at home that must be considered as we're thinking about their ability to both log in at specific times to fulfill somewhat attendance requirements and or um, ensure that they are following, following um, app, app recommendations um, and a sort of one size fits all approach. Okay, Megan, I'm wondering what, how these how these considerations or these challenges like play into how we account for for promotion and graduation for language learners. Yep, and they directly impact everything, right? We're talking about a different age of student here. We know K-12, there's been challenges, you know, across the board, even for post-secondary uh, institutions. But when we're really focusing in on this particular language um, student population, and then really honing in on secondary and all of these different layers that kind of make it more complex, and then we sit back and look at promotion and graduation, it's, it's high stakes. So Amanda, if we can go to the next slide, porfa, gracias. Um, bottom line is there's no one right way or answer to approach promotion or graduation uh, for these students, but we can say that these, these kids cannot be punished for these circumstances we find ourselves in. And so uh, assuring that we as leaders have systems that are in place that, that protect these students, that take into account all the things that you just described, Alexandra, uh, that take into account their unique needs as language learners and as students and, and the complex background and amazing, you know, funds of knowledge they bring to the education system, but that they're a unique group of students. And so when we, we look at you know, approaching different ways to determine promotion and graduation, um, really taking a stance of common sense, rooting ourselves in, in best practice and what's best for students at the end of the day, um, but always with that lens of, of equity. Um, but there isn't one right, you know, magic wand. This is, this is the right thing to do for every district and every state and every student, obviously. So let's dig in now a little bit to some of our considerations. Um, Alexandra, how about you take promotion? No, you can go back, Amanda, thanks. Perfect. Awesome. So in terms of promotion, um, I really wanna make sure that everybody understands like this is a long-term, there is no right or wrong, but we have to make sure that we're thinking about the long-term consequences of our of of the decisions that we make for the students that we serve okay so this is not, not a sense this is, this is a marathon particularly when it comes to your dual language multilingual um scythe slife in particular students think about what's going to be the best decision promote for students not in the short term not next year but in the long term, okay? Number two, and we've talked about this a number of times, right, Megan? Like, we have to anticipate the gaps that our students are gonna have. This is not a multilingual learner thing. This is every single one of our students, we're going to have to think very strategically about the gaps that, that they're gonna come, come with in the fall because of the fact that they've booked for anywhere two and six months. And that's just the reality. We already think about the summer slide. I don't want us to limit ourselves to like, like this idea of summer slide, but I want us to think more broadly in terms of when you have this little access and ability to practice your language of instruction, your language of acquisition, et cetera, et cetera, what are the implications of that 
And how is that going to impact your accessibility to like content knowledge, background knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. The third piece is we need to make sure that we have like twins and barriers. Okay. Like right now, most schools are in the process of finalizing their fourth quarter report cards, sending out those communications to their parents, closing out the school year. But Megan, you and I have talked about this, like we need to make sure that before that communication gets sent home to families, that there are some type of stop point to ensure that the best decision for students long term have been considered in that communication that goes that goes home and that we're not working to punish kids for situations that are outside of their control in the name of equity and equality, right? Mm -hmm. This is going to create like a slowdown of the decision making process and we know that schools move at literally the speed of lightning. I get that. Right now more than ever is the time for us to slow down rather than try to keep up with the typical pace of school so that we can ensure that we aren't making decisions in a one-size-fits-all fashion in the same way that we've always made them, mm -hmm. which are going to create a much more challenging long-term situation for our multilingual, dual language, and safe students. What are you thinking about that in terms of like graduation requirements, Megan? Yep, similar, you know, everything kind of connects here, right? Um, slowing down that decision-making process, I'll just add, if we really pause and think about every industry right now globally is impacted by this pandemic and is changing the way they are operating. And so when it comes to promotion and graduation, why wouldn't we do the same, right? Just pause and think about um, the decisions we're making and why we're making them and then that long-term impact on, on the students. And so when you go talking from promotion, you know, changing from grade to grade, definitely a high stakes decision, especially when you're talking that middle school, high school transition. But then graduation, we're talking about a student meeting, you know, state graduation criteria that's launching them into the real world, whatever their, you know, post-secondary decision, be college, a two-year degree, um, whether it's a trade school or going right into the workforce. Like we're thinking about what, where does that student need to be and, and how are we setting them up for success for that real world? So when we think about uh, the last couple months of schooling, you know, some schools being canceled, some going to e-learning and remote learning, uh, we, we, we're seeing everything. Um, what, how does that impact a student's pathway and, and kind of trajectory to graduation? Has that student been engaged in the learning? Has there been opportunities for learning? Um, for all of those considerations we previously discussed, are there different barriers to their learning? Um, and, and is it right for us to hold them accountable for those things that are out of their control? So some, some ideas um, to consider would be, for example, how is that student performing or what was their student data um, as of early March 2020, before schools started closing? Were they on track for, for graduation? And if so, does that mean they have met the criteria and they are ready to graduate? Can we take the data from early March and previous and use that as our, our kind of bar for meeting the criteria of graduation? That doesn't hold them accountable for all of these things that are out of the control and negatively impacting their education. Um, let's say we have a student that early March wasn't on track. Maybe, maybe they were at risk of not graduating or, or missing, missing that criteria by quite a bit already in early March. Um, how do we open our minds to having a more flexible timeline, adapting um, kind of that route to meeting the criteria? Some ideas are summer learning opportunities, and that could be starting right away in June or continuing through August. Um, having really focused support and guidance, almost like a watch list of at-risk students that, that aren't on the trajectory to graduation. Um, you know, with high schoolers, especially, you're thinking these are young adults by the time they're approaching that graduation milestone. And how do you approach 
it as like a we, a community of we're all in this together working towards this goal. And, and especially with school being closed and everybody being off in their own remote kind of world, how can you hone in on the students that need the most support, need the most guidance to get them to that, that goal of graduation? You know, kind of approaching it with a we mentality instead of the student off there on their own trying to achieve this. Anything to add to that, Alexandra? I do. So we have an amazing question that's come in. Mm -hmm. And that is like, what about those students that have not at all? If we don't have any um, information, data, anything, any indication from kiddos, um, our 15, 16, 17, 18 year olds and beyond, mm -hmm. since we went into sort of um, pandemic mode where there's a lot of stay at home orders, right? Mm -hmm. um, do you do you have thoughts that you want to share first? I know that I have personal because I have a high schooler at home. Yeah, go for it. Share share your thoughts. So for me, um, it goes back to this um, number one. There's no right answer. Okay, I want us to. I yes. You and I, Megan, I'm like, we're, we are the experts on multilingual learners, particularly for dual language and safe kiddos. But at the same time, like there is a handbook that tells us like what exactly it is that we're supposed to be doing right now. But I also have to like bring us back to like these common sense guidelines, these broader guidelines that say, listen, how do you have systems that don't, how do you ensure their systems so that kids aren't punished for things that are outside of their control, right? Like the fact that kiddos who, it's a very challenging time in their life, right? 15 to 18, 15 to 19 is not an easy time period. And it is a very social time. And so we're trying to recreate something that innately is not where they're at. And some students and some schools and some, some demographics are more, more successful in making that shift than others. But we want to make sure that when we are thinking about graduating students or promoting students for those benchmark years, and for a lot of the states, they happen to be like six, eight, 11, I think it is, Megan, right? Yeah. Somewhere around there, those are the promotion years. Like, we're thinking not about this year, like what they've done right now, but what's going to be the long-term consequence because two months of them logging in or not logging in is really not an indication of whether they're on track to really be successful and prepared for the world. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure that everybody knows, like for me with my own, I have a middle schooler, I have a high schooler, um, one, is a, one isn't a benchmark year, one is not. She's um, a seventh grader, but next year would be a benchmark year for her for promotion criteria. And I just, I, the same thing that I would advocate for my own children, which is, listen, there's no right or wrong, but in the long run, what does common sense tell you? What does data triangulation which is practice for understanding uh, student performance and using, utilizing that those those sort of data points as part of the decision making process and thinking about equity right like how do we ensure that those voices those students those demographics who are typically um oppressed by the system right they typically lose out by the system that we don't recreate structures that ensure that they're going to lose out by the system again? How do we create a formula that just makes sense for every child on a case-by-case -case basis? And that's one of the reasons why we really said, like, we just have to, in, in general, slow down the decision-making process. If it's typically a teacher grades something, they submit those grades, they get printed, a printing gets sent to the families, that needs to get slowed down we need to at least add one or two more steps in the process to ensure that we are utilizing the common sense plus, plus best practice 
plus equity focus into the formula. Do you want to add, add anything to that, Megan? No, I mean, well said. <laughs> and and it's, it's helpful even through your lens as a parent to to see these different, you know, stages along the way of the education continuum. And, and we can't, um, you know, stress enough the importance and what graduation means and promotion are those steps towards that goal of graduation. And if, if kids slip through the crack or because of this pandemic and home learning, we, we lose some kids and they, they don't come back and don't graduate. We, we can't, we can't let that happen. It is our responsibility to track those kids, to keep them on the path. Um, so just to reiterate what you said about that long-term, you know, these, these decisions are something that long-term is gonna impact this, these kids' success down the road, but then beyond their K-12 experience. I love it, thank you. Mm -hmm. so, um, and I'm getting um, feedback that I'm still breaking up a lot um, I'm going to try to hang with it. If for some reason my reception or the reception of like my end of things um, is not um, is not working or can't, is like just not tolerable, um, just please let me know so that we can make some adjustments on our end, okay? I am literally in the best place in my house, because, which is my bedroom. <laughs> I'm not very conducive to a lot of moving up. Um, Alexander, do um, are we able to pull? That being said, I want to. Are we, are we able, able to, to pull? pull listeners on what what they've been doing? Oh, I almost went forward, and Megan, that's such a great idea. We should not go forward. <laughs> we should pull everybody, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what are we pulling, Megan? Do you want to lead us in that? Sure. So, just taking some of these considerations we've been discussing how many um, of these promotion graduation kind of approaches or considerations has your district taken into account when you're planning for, you know, MLLs, your SIFE, SIFE, dual language learners, um, you know, one of them, a couple, four, all of them. We, hmm, I wonder if we had an option to say none of the above, but if it's none of the above, maybe just type that in the Q&A spot. I love it. Mm -hmm. They're also split, just so you know, they're split into dual language, multilingual, and slice. So there's three poles. Oh, great. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Amanda. You're, I appreciate all of our co-facilitators. So we are taking a poll. First poll. How many of these considerations have you, has your district taken into account? One, two, three of them, four of them, all of them, for dual language learners, okay? For dual language learners, how many have you already planned for? One, three, four, or all of them? We're gonna keep it open for another uh, 40 seconds. Another 20 seconds. Ten seconds. Three, two, one. Here we go. We are polling for the next group of our multilingual learners. Let's see. Ah, we can share the polling results. This is fabulous. This is amazing. So we're trying <laughs> polls for the first time during this call. I am thoroughly impressed. Like, look at that. Yep, and 38, almost 40% of you have already considered for your dual language learners all of these general considerations that we have to have in place. That's amazing. I want you guys to give yourself like literally like two, um, 
or asking about planning for strategically your dual language kiddos, which are not always, you know, at the table for strategic planning, particularly in times of crisis. Great job. All right. Next group. ¿Cómo lo hagamos? ¿Cómo lo, cómo lo, lo tenemos que hacer? Ah, oh, ahí están. Okay, two minutes. How many of these promotion graduation considerations has your district taken into account planning for MLLs, multilingual learners? So your, your multilingual kiddos in general, whether they're ESL, whether they are TBE, right? Like all of those other programming models, um, how many of these considerations have you, has your district put into, we got another minute and 15-ish seconds. And this is interesting. We have everything from all to none. I'm loving your vulnerability, your willingness to share and speak your truth. Much appreciated, right? It gives us a clear path forward when we know what we are and are not doing. Um, even in times of there being no right answer. We got 40 more seconds. Mira. Snaps out to the, those of you that are doing all of these recommendations. I'm sending with positive energy. Estoy mandando un abrazo, verdad? Because they're very lucky to have you. 15 seconds. Megan, you want to share the results? Because we got 10 seconds left for these last few responses. All right. I am not sure how to share. Is that an Amanda thing? Amanda? No, it's not. There it goes. It is. Woo <laughs> oh, good. Okay. Amazing. Fabulous. Okay. So we've got more, almost 60% of them. Yeah that are that doing fantastic. all of the general recommendations, general considerations for their multilingual learners. I'm super excited about that. Fantastic. Now, my good friends, if you are in those categories, if you are self-reflecting and your truth um, is that you are either in the none or the one or the two or three, you already know where your advocacy needs to start because the general things that cross state lines, state recommendations, state provisions, um, and all, all of those mandates at the state level, they're incorporated in some of those common sense general provisions that we just talked about and the considerations that everybody should be, should be making because they feed into federal requirements. Every single last one of them, right, Megan? Because we went through like yeah. the Title III, um, all of the ESSA federal requirements that are not state-based, but nationwide. Mm -hmm. um, and so we want to make sure that if you are in one of those categories, you know your next steps come from... Okay. Oops, I think you yeah, broke one more. Up, at least for me, Alexandra, you broke up right after you said your next steps are from this <laughs> list. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Megan. <laughs> we got one more. We got one more poll, and that is specific to our SIFE students. Right. Remember your secondary kiddos, secondary for most states falls somewhere around sixth grade through 12th grade. Yeah. They have significant interruption and or limited experience with formal education, right? There's a specific coding for your SIFE kiddos, but they have a timeline, right? So they have this time lock, the timeline and this like uh, district level clock that's tick, tick, ticking that they will be literally 
booted out of SIFE programming and the intensive support that we provide to those kiddos at a certain, at a certain line, right? So how many of us have like these considerations in place for these specific students who are some of your most vulnerable, some of your most brilliant, but vulnerable mm -hmm. students? All right. We've got four people who have shared their thoughts. We've got 30 seconds left. Brilliant, Alexandra. You said this is one of those populations that is just brilliant, what they bring to the table, and just resilient, like a resilient population, really hardworking yeah. population. They, they, they yeah. take finishing high school very seriously for the most part, right? We're, gen we're speaking in general terms here, but it's a population that is resilient and really hardworking. And it's so funny that you say that, Megan. I'm going to be honest with you. I um, taught in a newcomer center way, way, way back when. Mm -hmm. um, and my new newcomer site are some of the, my favorites that I ever served in my entire time as an educator. Um, they do want to do well. And they have overcome so many things that some adults will never know in their entire lifetime. Yeah. They've already overcome it by the age of 15, 16, 17, 18. Yeah. So I love my site out. Okay. Got to advocate for them. Yeah. But yeah. as we close out this poll, we got 13 seconds left. It seems like most of us have not necessarily thought of or considered this population. Okay. Again, if you are a district, if you're coming from a district who hasn't necessarily really thought about how do we support, what are going to be sort of the provisions that we make, how do we adjust and account for our current situation for our SLIFE or SIFE, depending on what state you're in and how you code it, their personal situation and the ticking, right, the clack, clack, clack that's tick, tick, ticking, we need to make sure that we go back and we think through that, that we advocate for our kiddos. Not only does it involve funding implications for the district in terms of the number of SIFE and SLIFE kiddos that we have, but it also has huge implications in terms of like this sort of um, sink or swim approach mm -hmm. that we to write even so. And now they're taking, because they're a junior, they're taking, I don't know, American lit, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Like that's a huge jump. And we have to think so through those criteria, those considerations, um, putting in place guidelines to make sure that we don't like put that on the shoulders of our kiddos, that they go from learning how to hold a pencil to American lit. Yeah. Your thoughts, Megan? Well, one, one thing we haven't really touched on when looking at these considerations um, for these student populations is kind of the, a certain mindset that we might run into as leaders that says, well, whoa, 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 you know, um, we can't be, a, you know, flexible and adapt the timeline. We, we don't want to diminish the diploma. You know, how would you respond to, to that sort of approach or someone who said that to you? That's such a brilliant question. Um, internally, I'm like this, mira, no comiente conmigo. That's what I want to say, but we don't say that. That's the internal dialogue that we don't let um, become the external dialogue. The reality is that um, if we had English speaking students, that we were at um, American or U.S. government in another language, we would never ask them to do that because we would say that it's unfair, right? It's unfair for English speaking students to take American Lit or to take government or to take biology in a language that they don't fully understand. And yet these are students that we're asking them to do the mm -hmm. same thing, right? And so we have to bring that same 
for monolingual English speaking students, we're not gonna do it. And we're gonna ensure, right, that we also protect the rights of multilingual students. It's not a deficit, right? Mm -hmm. Right now, more than ever, we should realize that we need more multilingual people in the world. Right now, we literally have calls to action around the globe for people that can speak a variety of languages because we need to be able to connect to others. Uh, we do, like, it's just a reality that is now becoming more apparent, right? But the same logic that we approach our monolingual English speaking students in the US, we need to be willing through an equity lens to be able to approach our multilingual students. And if we're not gonna ask English speaking students to take a course in a language that they're not fully fluent in, then we should not be trying to hold our multilingual students accountable for the same production of language in a language that they're not fully fluent in because mm -hmm. the ask is not the same, mm -hmm. right? Um, and essentially, we, that, that, is, that is equity for me, right? Like, how do we ensure we stay focused on what it is that we want students to produce, not ask them to compromise who they are, the languages that they bring, or shame them for something that's actually a societal asset. Mm -hmm. So, any additional thoughts on that, Megan? No, I almost forgot that point. Beautiful. And it's a great transition to our next point about the bilingual seal, because really the, the seal of biliteracy or bilingual seal, it's something that celebrates a student's, you know, yeah. bilingualism, multilingualism, and, and is kind of propping up um, that, that multilingual identity in, in students rather than it being a, a burden, so to speak. It's an asset, it's, it's added to bilingualism. So do you wanna take this slide? I do. I do. So I love the fact that you're like, you made that transition and that connection. Um, for our dual language students, there are state-based requirements. Like we're not going to get into the we yeah. about what each state from coast to East coast, North to South. There are nuances that I want everybody to make sure that they know from their state-based agencies um, and connections. But what we do have to really think about is there are testing requirements for our secondary kiddos um, to get the seal of biliteracy that for some of our kids in middle school, they can already qualify because based on their, their state testing, their district testing requirements, they can qualify for secondary and biliteracy um, proficiency standards already, right? Mm -hmm. So some of our southern states, they already have assessment practices in place that allow their sixth, seventh, eighth graders to meet the criteria, the criteria for biliteracy and bilingualism, which is amazing, okay? That being said, I want us to utilize that, A, as an indication of the gaps that we have if we don't already have a system in place, but B, I want us to really utilize it as data that already exists for us having sources of data, sources of information, sources of knowledge around who is bilingual and bi biliterate for those of us that don't have testing and assessment systems that allow students to get that seal of biliteracy right now. Right now, more than ever, ever again, we pipeline of bilingual, biliterate people. And so we should not be putting in any barriers that stops the flow of that pipeline, okay? Mm -hmm. So if you have the ability to triangulate data that already exists, or you already have information systems that tell it, and, and I know that you, you and I have had this conversation, like we've been very upfront with districts, we need to waive whatever those requirements are so that we remove barriers from the pipeline to having an ongoing stream of biliterate and biliterate um, adults in our communities, in, in, our, in, our, in our school systems, period. Mm -hmm. The other piece is if you already have partnered with assessment companies, we need to start having conversations with them already. We need to right now, changing what those timelines are 
for those CELA biliteracy um, assessments. So I know that I, I live in Chicago, right? Illinois has already released certain timelines, um, certain communications about assessment windows for the fall. I personally, with a middle schooler and a high schooler, feel like those timelines are premature. But... Uh-oh, we might have lost her. If you're or weeks not ready, um, communicated the timelines are critical. Alexander, you're breaking uh -oh, quite you a hear bit. Me? Nope, you're turning into a robot on us. Hello, hello. There, maybe we have you back. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yep, you're back. Woo! Great, I apologize. Thank you so much. I appreciate my co-facilitator. Um, if you're in a state um, that has not already communicated, the testing timeline for receiving the bacilla by literacy, I will tell you, you need to make sure that that's part of your hmm. We're losing you again, Alexander. How about I just finish up with the seal of biliteracy and then maybe your internet will be you need to make sure that this is flexible with you. Can you, you think that me? you can get I can. Okay. You're chop you're choppy again quite a bit. So I'll just kind of touch on on what I I know you were getting at, which is that right now more than ever the seal of biliteracy needs to be a priority for us and state by state it's going to look differently because the requirements are different but that if we're thinking about these language learners um, especially in high school those that are are attempting to apply for that seal um, through the state uh, this gap in learning our e-learning our you know pandemic reality cannot inhibit their you know pathway to getting the seal of biliteracy because this again is something that they take with them um, post high school post k-12 and and it's 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 building a greater community around celebrating bilingualism promoting um you know encouraging students to continue with their bilingualism biliteracy their cultural identity uh, it, there's just so much more than just it being a a seal you know of uh, on a diploma, for example. So, so whatever, you know, you, as, as leadership in the district needs to do to make this a priority, along with like the concept or the, the topic of promotion and graduation, like this is, this is right up there. We can move on, Amanda, to the next slide. Because as we're looking at the time here and kind of wrapping up, we want to make sure that we really ground ourselves in this conversation back to what Alexandra brought up in the beginning, which is our legal responsibility, right? Our ELs are a protected class in civil rights law. So if we're thinking about equal access to services, programs, activities, that umbrella covers promotion and graduation. And so taking into account what we've been talking about, bringing common sense to these decisions, keeping best practices, um, student interest in mind when you're making these long-term decisions or decisions right now that are affecting those kids long term and then obviously always through that equity lens um, you know this directly impacts these how we should be approaching promotion in, in graduation see if Alexandra's back with us if you want to add anything to that okay do you hear me yes yeah <laughs> No, I think that you, you hit it on the head, like, right? Like, I want everybody to understand, like, exactly what you said. If we put these pieces in the place, we ensured that their rights were protected, mm -hmm. then we can hold them accountable to whether or not they produce. But if we can't, right, the long-term impact sometimes is, is more detrimental mm -hmm. for us.
us holding them back, promoting them away with extended supports, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and, and we have to take that into consideration because it's not, this is not business as usual. We right. cannot say that, oh my gosh, these kids were just lazy because it's more than just that. And I have been a secondary teacher. I know that sometimes we have kids that make us want to pull our hair out. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, even if we do, these are things that are outside of their control and we cannot use this opportunity to punish them for like personal feelings that we may have, they simply do not have control of. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, next slide, Amanda. So looking at these critical data points, we wanted to include this, um, you know, directly connecting to our legal responsibilities because as leaders, if we're not kind of hitting these four points, again, are we setting up these language learners for success for that trajectory to graduation? So distribution and allocation of resources to needs, meaningful engagement, accessibility of achievement, reasonability of learning task. When we think about the last couple months especially, but also prior to that, because we know that that this school or school closures e-learning has brought glaring you know forward all the the areas of growth problems um, inequities that are happening in our school system and so taking everything into account and then with the current situation of having schools not physically open and trying to make these big important decisions of promotion and graduation you know, if we can't say we've been hitting these four dear critical data points, it's, it's not our students' fault. We are not also not pointing the finger at leaders. It's, it's a collective, right? It's a collective system. So, but as leaders, what can we do now, right? And, and when we approach these important decisions of promotion and graduation. Anything to add to that, Alexandra? No. Oh, I think you hit it like spot on. I want to make sure that, right, like you said, we take this time to think about what gaps this pandemic is exposed, like yeah. are exposing, yeah. so that we can be very thoughtful and critical um, leaders moving forward, advocates moving forward, yeah. and that we seek out those allies, uh, like cross departmentally that we're going to need in order to shift some of the practices that already were not um, in favor of yeah. our multilingual learners and our site kiddos um, already, right? Like we knew these things existed. This is bringing it to the surface in a, in a much more glaring way. How do we take this time, take this opportunity to make the shifts that should have happened a while ago and you have uh, very critically um, and intentionally in order to make that shift happen? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, moving forward. Okay, my friends, you guys know, okay? Dare to be agents of change, okay? This is not a time for us to do things off the shelf. It is not a time for our dual language or scythe or multilingual learners in general to have us just go with the flow. I know that it's sometimes hard to be the one at the table, but like, um, sorry, but I have a question again. What about our kids who, right? Like some of us are the only voice at the table. Rebel, please remember that they need you at the table. They need you to be bold. They need you to be thoughtful, right? Not to meter de la paz. That, right like do that but time they need us to be the ones advocating for a change and a shift towards theory best practice common sense and not we they don't need people who are going to be silent and allow change to move like what we do as a school district towards to or closer to um business as usual mm -hmm. 
right. Last couple. Ya <laughs> estamos. Oh, we're at 1259. How did we do? How did we do this in like literally an hour? <laughs> You're amazing, Megan. Magic. I know, right? Hmm. So my friends, as you guys know, um, well, some of you don't know, we do, um, we're one of the few, I think, people that like have personal experience and professional experience in the secondary world. Um, because Megan and I, our hearts are so near and dear to the secondary world, we are more than happy to offer like consultations, um, 30 minute post uh, Wednesday webinar consultations but you got to be serious about your secondary multilingual learner populations. If you're serious about them, we'll be serious about you and offer that. Um, you can go either to our, our website or email us. And you also have our phone number um, for this population, this group of students. Um, and then finally, you all know we have Final Diapositiva Ultima. There we go. We have these additional PDs, coaching, technical support opportunities that are available. We have the DLLO, the um, coaching teachers in bilingual dual language classrooms, ELDLA, equity. But we also have Spanish literacy, Spanish language arts, K-12, that is about to be released. I could not be more excited um and it's on its way so if you're interested in any of these other pieces please don't hesitate to us let us know um we will as always right megan we're gonna stay on for about 10 minutes yep yep so anybody can submit questions they have anything to follow up on any lingering wonderings Thank you so much for joining us. Gracias. We love you. Le estamos mandando abrazos y besos y todo eso. Tenemos que mandar amor en la vida, ¿verdad? Thank you. Thank you, Katrina. Uy, thank you. A ver. Yo no sé cómo hacerlo. Oh, Katrina. Thank you, Katrina. <laughs> All right. Let us know if you have any questions. We will be on till one second, right? Maybe? Yeah. Not too long. We still have a few people with us. We do. You're so brilliant. I did not think that we were going to be able to get through all of this content in an it hour. It was, it was a lot. lot. We did it. We did. We did it. Si queremos parar de grabar esta llamada, la grabamos, ¿verdad?